everybody. Welcome to our Bible study tonight, live from Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. I'm Mike Bloom, pastor, pastor of Breath of Life Christian Teaching Center. And we're continuing our series on the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And God has just been so wonderfully opening up His Word. And I'm sure it's going to continue again tonight. We've come to the place where week after week, we get into the Word, prepared for the study, but then in the middle of it all, God will show us something that we never expected. And we're just believing God for that again tonight. You know, that's, that's what I love about revelation experiences. And what I mean by that is we receive revelation. We get insight from God. And it's not all cerebral. It's not all things that are memorized and laid out in our fleshly abilities. But it's God actually opening up his word. And the light shining on. And this has just been part of our teaching ministry for several years. And we're just going further ever than ever I've been before in the word of the Lord. And, and words of God coming to us. And so this glory of God in the face of Jesus series has just been such a blessing. And uh, you noticed on our countdown we've got a door. And it's from Revelation chapter 5 where John said a door was opened in heaven. And uh, then he said there was a throne in there when he went in and, and he was invited to come up hither. And it always reminded me of Moses back in Exodus chapter 20 when he was invited to come up to the mountain where God came down to the mountain and Moses went up. But in Revelation, there's so many parallels between the Exodus and the book of Revelation. God didn't come down. The door was in heaven and God invited John to come all the way up. He went way past Moses, went right up into glory. And when Moses was in the presence of God on Mount Sinai, when God came down, God showed him the Ark of the Covenant. He showed him the table of showbread and the seven golden candlesticks. But in Revelation, actually, they correspond in the same sequence where God showed John the throne, which the Ark of the Covenant symbolized, and the 24 seats with 24 elders which corresponds kind of to the table of showbread and seven golden candlesticks. John saw the seven lamps of fire around the throne. It's all corresponding. But again, the beautiful thing is, John went all the way up to glory. God took him right up in there. But he only brought Moses to the top of the mountain and God had to come down. And I think that's kind of a bit of the picture of the gospel. You see, in the new covenant, heaven's been open to us. Where in the old covenant, Moses... They were limited. They didn't have the blood of the Lamb atoned for their lives. But the reason I mention that countdown with that door in heaven is uh, Brad's going to sing a song now. And we had this played Sunday about the open door because we're talking about entrance into the kingdom life in these series. And it all happens by the glory of, the, of God in the face of Jesus Christ that changes us into his image so that we can enter into this kingdom glory. So let's get ready for the word of the Lord as this song helps prepare the way.
Amen, amen. Now, keep in mind tonight, we're going to have time for questions and answers and comments at the end of this, so stick around. And uh, let's get ready to get right into the word of the Lord tonight. Praise God. So as you see, we entitled this Faith at the Valley of Decision. And we've been talking so much about Jacob having come from afar after having left the promised land and going back and where he saw God face to face, which Paul references in, a, in the spiritual sense for us, where he was changed into Israel, Jacob, Penuel means facing God, and he said, I've seen God's face and I've lived. Talk about living. When you translate that into the New Testament, face God and lived, it's like resurrection life. You come into a new birth experience and you're changing more like him. And then Jacob went right to the place called Shechem. And eventually he buried his idols there. He said, God's the God of Israel, which was his new name, and not just the God of Abraham and Isaac. But that's where Jesus met the woman at the well, the same place, which represents entrance. It's where Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 6, first landed when he came into the promised land, six verses after you begin reading about Abraham from Genesis, the very beginning of his whole story. And that's where Jacob went, that's where uh, Jesus went, and all of it is related. And Joshua even went there, the valley of decision between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. But let's pick up and get into some things. And I was really wanting to get into this Sunday, didn't have the time. But in John chapter 4, verse 31, he's at Sychem or Shechem, and it's Sychar or Sychem. In Genesis, it's Shechem later on after Abraham's time and Jacob's time, and it's Sychar in Jesus' time, all the same place. So he just spoke to this woman at the well at this point. And he talked about the rivers of living water, that the water that she was coming to drink from. She just thirst again. But the waters that Jesus had would give her a well inside of her and she'd never thirst again because the well would be right in her. You know, that's a reference to the baptism of the Spirit of God. And uh, when you get the Spirit of God in you, it's in you. You don't go here, you don't go there, it's in you. And you carry a well of living water around in you. So how are you going to get thirsty? You got the well of living water inside you. But while she went and realized he was the Messiah and Jesus had corrected her in a bunch of things, like Jacob had to be corrected on his way back, like Israel had to be corrected on their way back to the promised land out of Egypt. He spoke to his disciples. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And similar to what he said to the woman at the well about drink, drink that she didn't know. You know, she was thinking of natural water. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Like, who gave him food? We went to go get food. And, and here he says he's got food. That's what we've brought with us. But Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say ye not, therefore, or rather, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. He talked about water of everlasting life. Now he's talking about fruit of eternal life that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, you are entered into their labors. And the wonderful thing is that's such an allusion to the Garden of Eden where God planted the garden, God watered the garden, God planted the trees, and God put Adam in there to reap what God himself had sown. And 
Again, this whole return to Canaan, return to this area. Shechem was like the entranceway, the right at the borders. Uh, all of that, it's like getting back into the garden and getting us right. Now, I want to also bring this up and let me go back to our screen. And I want to show you these pictures here. We ended off with this Sunday morning. We talked about how the Ark of the Covenant was a model of the glory of God. And if you look in Exodus chapter 25 and 20, verse 22, God said he would meet when he's talking to Moses. I'll meet with you. I'll commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim. And there's a picture of the Ark. And here... Jesus was depicted to sit on the right-hand throne in heaven, and that ark represents the throne that Jesus sat on in heaven. It's a symbol of the kingdom. When you think of this, think of the kingdom whenever you think of the ark. Think of God ruling. Think of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's been king for 2,000 years. Amen. But then we came to this part, and see this was at Shechem. This, what we're going to show you, is Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim at the very place where Abraham entered into the promised land, where God returned Jacob after he left the promised land and came back at Shechem. This is where Joshua, in fact, we're going to show you that again. Mount Ebal was on the right, or left rather. Mount Gerizim was on the right. And there, the Bible tells us that Moses directed them to put the Ark of the Covenant between these two mountains. The curses were listed at Mount Gerizim, and the blessings were listed at Mount, I'm sorry, the curses were at Mount Ebal, excuse me, and the blessings were at Mount Gerizim. And then we showed you that Matthew 25 has that same picture where Jesus is sitting on a throne with cursed goats on his left and blessed sheep on his right. Now, let, let me show you that and bring that right up in the scripture. We'll go to Matthew chapter 25. And it amazed me when I first saw this. Just flowing together. It talks about, by the way, the kingdom of heaven. And it talks about the five foolish virgins, the five wise. Uh, notice there's wise and there's foolish, just like there's blessings and there's cursings. It's like a fork in the road type of picture. And then after that, gives you that whole parable. We then go to the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country. And he calls his servants and he delivers them to them goods and five talents to, to one and to another two, to another, uh, so forth and so on. And it's always making decisions. It's a decision-talking uh, kind of context. And then later on, let me see, we go down here. And then, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, He's King now. He's coming in His glory. When He came the first time, he came to that stable in such a humble condition as a baby, born in a filthy barn. And all the holy angels are going to come with him when he comes in his glory. Then he's going to sit upon the throne of his glory, he said. There, notice that, sitting on the throne. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king's going to say to them on the right hand, Come you, blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. And then they're going to say, Lord, when did we see you hungered and fed thee and, and thirsty and we gave you drink? He said, when saw we thee a stranger, took thee in or naked and clothed thee. 
When saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? He said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. But then he says to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed. So here you've got the same picture that we're showing you in Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal with the blessings and the cursings. And the Ark of the Covenant was specifically said to be placed between these two mountains. Just like Jesus on his throne has all nations gathered unto him. And when he's on that throne, one group of sheep whom he calls blessed are on the right and the goats are on the left. And he specifically says about the goats that you're cursed. <laughs> and so it's the exact same picture. The ark is like the throne of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So let's go back to that diagram again now. And just look at that. There's like Jesus in the middle on the throne. And then the goats where the cursing is, the sheep where the blessing is. And it was like, are they going to accept the rest? They're, the Bible called the land of Canaan the rest and a resting place. It's where the temple would be built. Seek out a city for my name and there I'll put my name there. And he talked about the temple and, and the Ark of the Covenant would be positioned there. And it was the land of rest. He goes, seek out a rest and, and you'll rest. And, and eventually all the wars were defeated, uh, were fought rather, and Israel had won. And then they had rest all around about the land. But this is at the entrance. This is when Joshua took them in and he spoke these words. And it was at the very place Shechem where Abraham first entered it, very place Jacob went in, where Jesus talked to the woman at the well called Sychar. And then because there's two mountains here and they've got to decide if they're going to obey God and be blessed or disobey him and be rejected and cursed, Joel spoke about multitudes, multitudes in the valley between two mountains of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And that was a prophecy of Jerusalem rejecting Jesus and judgment came. And, you know, let me throw this in there. I believe Matthew 25 already happened. I just want to say Matthew 25 already happened. It's talking about the kingdom. It's talking right on the heels of Matthew chapter 24. And let's again look at this scripture. Uh, in Matthew 25, when he said, when did we see you a stranger? When did we take you in? When were you naked and clothed? And, and now these are the people that are standing as sheep. And he's saying, you folks have done this to me. And then they said, how did we do it to you? And they said, he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren. So every one of these sheep did this to the least of those Jesus brethren. They, they clothed him when he was naked. They clothed those least. When they were sick, these people visited them. When he, they were in prison, they came and, and hungry. And you know, the only, th this might shock you, but the only time in history, and because it, it is history, that this could be applied to is not our future, because how is he going to take everybody in our future and say, you visited people when they were in the hospital and sick or in prison? And it's talking about prison. It's saying every one of them had gone to people in prison. I, I haven't gone and ministered to a person in a prison before. I know pre preachers that have. But every one of us, according to that context, every one of the people, rather, that Jesus was talking to, they went to the prison. They went when people are naked. They went when they had no food. That applies to the persecution in the first century that you find in the book of Acts. That cannot apply to uh, North American natives way back hundreds of years ago because there wasn't even jails then that existed. And it can't apply to the end of the world where every one of us come before the great white throne judgment. That's going to happen in our future, the great white throne judgment. But this judgment, it's talking about something else. In fact, if Matthew 24 was already fulfilled, as I believe it is, notice he says at the first of the chapter, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. When? 
when you read the events of Matthew 24, and he talks about uh, the flood coming, representing the coming of the Lord and judgment. It's not talking about stealing the church away in a rapture. That's another message altogether. It's talking about taking the sinners out with the flood power and, and wrath of God. And that's what's going to be. Two are going to be in the field. One's going to be taken like Noah was preserved, but the sinners were taken by the flood. People are going to be taken in destruction. This isn't a case where you don't want to be left behind as the left behind books and the left behind movies have, have tried to promote. This is a thing where you want to be left behind because Noah was left behind after the sinners were destroyed by the flood. And that's going to be the way it is in the coming of the son of man. When one is taken in destruction and one is left. Hallelujah. But that's all Matthew 24. That's all first century for. And right on the heels of that, then at that time, the kingdom's like an under 10 virgins. It talks about the parables of the sowers, uh, or rather the talents. It talks about the pounds, it calls it in, in Luke. And then it talks about the sheep on the left, and, or the right, and the goats on the left, and the blessings and the cursings. So I, I, if I wa don't watch myself, I'll slip right into eschatology here. But the point is, you've got the same picture that you're seeing with Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal with the Valley of Decision and the Ark of the Covenant between them both, just like Joel prophesied. And Jesus was talking about Jerusalem being destroyed. And, and here, it's a prophecy of Jerusalem's rejection of truth that you're reading in Joel. But look at this. New Testament version of Shechem is Sychar. That's where Jesus met the woman at the well. He comes to that city. It's a parcel of ground that Jacob, see, we've been talking about Jacob landing on that spot. And then we already read this. I'll just skip by this for a moment. Talking about the well of water that springeth up into everlasting life. Uh, same thing Moses talked about, hints of the garden, so to speak. And then here's the scriptures where the disciples came to Jesus asking about food. And let me just go by there again, because we've kind of covered that. Uh, but watch what I'm leading up to. Just give me a moment here as we get back into the word and our screen. I want to introduce the screen again in the middle, in a, in a minute here, but let me take you right now to Matthew chapter four and the third verse. Now, what's so interesting is Jesus was entering into his ministry. Jesus was going into the promised land, so to speak. He's entering into the ministry. And just like he was wanting to bring people into the kingdom, new covenant life. And he went to that woman at that well and the Samaritans and uh, revealed to them things she needed to get straightened out. The Jews, Jews are correct when they say worship God at Jerusalem. You, you Samaritans are incorrect when you say at this mountain, Gerizim. But here, Jesus, when he was entering into his ministry, Satan came to tempt him. Think of cursings and think of blessings. Think of a fork in the road. And you've got to make a decision. And even Jesus Christ as a man had to make this decision. Whether he would follow the leading of the Lord, the Father, or give in to the temptations of the devil. And it says in verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, let me just home right in on those two verses, verses three and four. A few weeks ago, we preached a message about manna and how that manna literally means what is it? And God had brought them to the wilderness to direct and to teach them. And I want to take you right now back there again, because this has even personally really blessed myself lately, this whole thought. And it was just bubbling in my spirit in the last week or so. But in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 15, 
When the children of Israel saw the manna on the face of the wilderness, there was a small round thing as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. They said to one another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And manna literally means, what is it? And Moses said, this is the bread which the Lord God had given you to eat. Jesus was tempted to turn stone into bread. He talked to the disciples about bread that they didn't know of, and his meat was to do the will of God and to finish it. All of this is related in a way I never saw before. And this manna, it's referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when Moses is ready to leave them and just wanted to go over the law with them one more time. Because look at this in Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. I put you in here to humble you, he said. I tested, I proved you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And Moses talking, God humbled you and suffered you to hunger. And then he fed you with manna, which you didn't know. Your fathers didn't know it so that he could make you know that man doesn't live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Moses was giving these words at the entrance to the land of Canaan. He was ready to go. God would take him and Bible says God buried him. And Joshua would take over from this point. And just like Joshua would take them in the land and they'd set up the Ark of the Covenant. And there it would be between the cursing and the blessing. And Jesus gathers the sheep on his right, the goats on his left, and he's sitting between them on that throne, talking about the kingdom land. And here Moses is telling them that God wanted to test you. He wanted to see what was in your heart. He says, he gave you something that you never heard of before. You didn't know what God was going to do, and you couldn't think of anything to get yourself surviving. You You had to survive. You were hungry. There was no food. There was no natural way for you to obtain any food whatsoever. And you didn't even know what God was going to do. So he purposely did this and brought you something nobody can look back in time and say, remember when that happened? It's manna. It had never happened before. Your fathers never knew anything about it. And he says, I've got to get you to the place. And this is what I want to focus on tonight. God said, I've got to get you to the place where you trust in me so much and you obey my word that you understand you're not going to survive at times by your own wits. You're going to have to trust in me. And when you trust in me, you're not even going to know what I'm going to do. I will put situations, you will walk through them. And and I think God does this to us today. I think he puts us in circumstances and he allows it to happen. By the way, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted of the devil. Think of it. The Spirit led him into a place where he would be tempted by the devil. The, The pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day led them through that wilderness. Literally, they were tempted of the devil left and right too. And Jesus faces that at the beginning of his ministry. And it's like he learned from the very first attack of the devil, the truth that God was trying to tell Israel. I'm giving you something nobody ever heard of before. You you could not predict. You see, the key is, and this is what struck me so much, is When I'm in control, when I know what God's going to do, and I know what I'm going to do, and I know what situation I'm going to go through and how to resolve it, my flesh is in comfortable control. And God doesn't want that. He wants us to lean on Him so much. He wants us to have the kind of faith that when we don't know what to do, and we know God's going to have to do something, but we can't even imagine what God would do but we're still relaxed because we know he's going to come through somehow. That is a really high bar to raise and and try to come up to that level and have that kind of faith. It's it's like you, you almost shudder. To get to that place where you imagine, I've got so much faith in God that I've learned to be content 
Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, in whatever state I'm in. You know, he said, I've learned how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how to have everything going against me. I know how to be blessed beyond measure. I've been in both situations. But he said, I'm not just content when I'm being blessed because he said, I have learned in whatever state I'm in therewith to be content. Therein rather to be content. And that's what God's trying to do here. And that's what Jesus was doing. The devil was trying to get him to put things in his control. You resolve the problem yourself. You turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. You need food. He said, Satan, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord shall man live. And he says, I'm getting this because it's written. And and I'm showing you right here in Deuteronomy 8 and 3 where Jesus was quoting from. Isn't it wonderful to be able to look at a verse like Deuteronomy 8 and 3, point at it, and say, Jesus quoted that. And he attacked the devil with it when the devil attacked him. And he sent the devil away eventually as the temptations went on. But he learned that. As a man, he had to learn. You might say, well, he's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. He doesn't need to learn anything. Oh, as a man, he grew in wisdom and stature. He grew as a man. As a man, Hebrews 5 says, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And he became the author of salvation. Hallelujah. He became, he learned. But here, purposely want to get you into situations, God's saying, where I will humble you and I'll suffer you to hunger. And you know, when you're going without anything, you could say you're hungering. You have a need. You're lacking something. You're hungering for finances. Maybe you're hungering for health, you know, uh, but here in this case, literal food, because it's a principle he's showing them. He said, I want you to know that you don't just live by bread. You don't just live by natural bread, that food is something natural you're being provided with. God is going to have to step in and do something for you to survive every now and then. He literally is. You know, if people learned this, nobody would have nervous breakdowns. Because the reason these kinds of things happen is life gets so overwhelming that we literally break. We have a nervous breakdown. We break. And and this key of being relaxed Because you know God's going to do something, even when you don't know what it is. When I first entered the ministry, my first year of ministry, full-time ministry, I was in Newfoundland in Bayvert, Newfoundland, Canada. And here, the uh, I was living on unemployment insurance. Some of you heard this before. I won't prolong this, but I want to bring this out. I had to go on unemployment insurance. The congregation was small and couldn't support me. And pastors are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that they are to live of the altar. They're to live of the offerings that people bring. And the workman is worthy of his hire, Jesus said. And he even said, when you go into the city, don't take a purse, don't take a scrip. You know, the workman is worthy of his hire. They will, you will live by their support. And uh, people get uptight about it, but that's Bible, (laughs) you know. The man of God has to live too. Not to get wealthy. This is where Jesus said, you know, you don't get wealthy with it. But at the same time, the workman's worthy of his hire. There's some that are making wealth from the gospel, and that's not right. But at any rate, I knew that that was going to run out one day. And I was looking for work, trying to find jobs. Couldn't get it. And so time came. Got my last unemployment check from the from the country. And then I I just prayed. I said, God, if I never believe you before, I'm believing for you now to do something. I need this. Preachers have left when they're in this state. And I don't think you want me to leave less than a year after I got here. And so I said, you sent me here. You're going to provide. And you know something? I'm not even, I didn't even realize that till now. I actually was shown by God to picture myself like Jacob, holding on to God and not letting go until he blessed me. And I said, I'm praying through, and I'm going to pray until I break through, and I know you're going to bless me. And this is the kind of prayer I learned how to pray. you got to pray until you know. And 
Don't ask me how you know, because all I can say is you'll just know when you've broken through. You'll just know it. You'll get that revelation, that overwhelming awareness that you broke through. And I actually pictured myself just, and this is what happened to Jacob just before he went to Shechem. That place where the ark was placed between the two mountains, the blessings and the cursings, the entrance going back into the promised land. And this was the beginning. This was the entrance of my ministry. I was in the ministry for the first year of my entire ministry. And this happened to me. And, and God spoke to me, said, if you will believe, doubting nothing, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and it shall be done. And that hit me so strong. God said, I'll do it if you don't doubt. Doubt nothing, Mike. And, and doubts would start to attack. I'd say, no, I'm not doubting. I start to get discouraged. I, discouraged. I felt like talking discouragement. No, I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to get it out of my head. Hallelujah. Get it out of your heart, heart you believe with, and get it out of your mouth with the mouth confession is made. And I was so strong and so confident that God heard my prayer, that I told our congregation, I don't know what God's going to do, but you folks know the church here can't support me. I've got my last check Friday and I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. This is manna that their forefathers never knew about. And I'm saying, what is it? What is it that God's going to do? Hallelujah. And I knew it. I was confident. I was relaxed. And it happened to me again last summer. It's interesting. The beginning of my ministry and just last summer, I had a powerful experience of that as well. Traveling in my old motorhome, everything breaking down. But I had so much faith at that time that I knew God knows exactly where I am. God knows what I need. And I don't know how, but we're going to get through this. And I was literally relaxed in the midst of a hurricane and a tornado of things going wrong. And God spoke that this message I'm teaching in this series is bringing us to a place where we've got faith, where we don't know what God's going to do, but we know he's going to do something. Hallelujah. And that's, I believe, what Jesus was trying to let the devil know. I'm not taking this into my own control. I'm not going to say, okay, I'm going to turn stone into bread. This is a thing where I can't find food here. And if my father wanted to give me bread, he even said that in chapter 8 of John, he wouldn't give me stone if I asked for bread. He literally said that a few chapters after Matthew 4, when he says, actually it's Matthew, I'm sorry, chapter 8, I believe. But after Matthew 4, when the devil said, take the stone and turn it into bread, a few chapters later, Jesus said, if I asked my father for bread, he wouldn't give me a stone. A stone is what the devil was trying to get him to take. A stone is what the devil was trying to make him get bread out of. But he said, if I ask my father for bread, he's not going to give me a stone. I'm trusting my father. Hallelujah. Dad is going to take care of me. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do it. And that was the entrance of Jesus' ministry. And it blessed me so much to think that happened at the beginning of my ministry. I literally was in a place of faith where I didn't know what God was going to do. I needed a miracle and he did it hallelujah god and god is wanting us to have and maintain that kind of faith because i've gone up and down in that kind of faith you know i've been up and down but every time i study the word like we're studying it it's easy to believe god for this stuff it's easy just as god provided the answer that they could never dream of when he gave them manna and he caused them to survive by it. The whole thing Jesus is saying is man can't survive by just the natural provision of bread. But God has to speak something and provide it by his speaking. And you know what's so interesting is that Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 that the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, and he was referring to Genesis light, let there be light. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just starting to see the remnants of something right now I've never seen before. But there's, a con there's some kind of a clue in this context where the Genesis, let there be light, where Paul then said, it's in the face of Jesus. And then at chapter 3, verse 18, that was 4 and 6. Chapter 3, verse 18 says, you gaze at that face of Jesus 
and you're turned into that same image. And that's Jacob at Penuel when he was changed from Jacob to Israel. Penuel means facing God. And we are experiencing a new covenant trans transformation into Jesus' image by looking at his face. And that's kind of the same thing where we get this faith and that's the bread. He said, Satan, not just natural bread. And he said to the disciples at that very place, disciples, I've got bread that you don't know anything about. My bread is to do the will of God and finish it. And the will of God is to have a kind of faith that no matter what we go through, we're going to be relaxed. We're going to know God's going to provide, even though we don't have a clue what he's going to do to provide us. And this is our survival that's at stake. What happens to us is we get in survival mode and, and we lash out like wild animals because we're trying to protect ourselves. But he says, you need to relax. You need to rest and have that kind of faith where God's going to do something and you don't even know what he's going to do, but you're so overwhelmingly convinced he's going to do it that you're relaxed. And that's got something to do with seeing Jesus' face and being changed into his image. And I'm going to have to go back over what I just said a minute or so ago because I want to dig in. I'm feeling there's like traces of gold I'm seeing in the rock. And I know, wait a minute, there's a mother load of gold if I keep following these veins. Just like, all the veins in the body lead to the heart. There's a heart somewhere that I want to open up into. Hallelujah, God. And I started catching it just the last few minutes. But to have that kind of faith where we're changed and we maintain that and we go into a ministry where God is using us and, and we're going to survive. We don't have to worry. He's going to take care of us. And it reminds me of what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God rather, and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The raiment he was talking about. If you read Matthew chapter six, he was talking about food and clothing. The Gentiles seek after these things, but you seek first the kingdom of God and these things that the Gentiles seek, they'll be added unto you anyway. I'll take care of you. I will sustain you. Martin's watching this. I just asked Martin yesterday. Was it yesterday, Martin, or the day before? I, I said, how are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while. And you said you were in a situation just like I was in. And then God brought you into an opportunity the very next day. And you had all these provisions come. Hallelujah. We're just talking about that. And then having that confidence that I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. And when he had somebody in my life across the end of the continent in California, and I was in Newfoundland, you couldn't get any further part of North America than Newfoundland and California. <laughs> and there, God moved on a man to send me money every week to match what I was getting on my unemployment. And he didn't even know what I was going through at the time. That's what I was answered with by prayer. When I told you I entered into this thing in my ministry and it's the person that Jacob became when he entered into Israel, he literally became the person of Israel. When Joshua met the angel at the entrance to Canaan that had a sword, he was bringing Israel into the promised land. And that sword was like the sword from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And the mouth of Jesus Christ emitting a sword represents the word of God. Hallelujah. And you see that in the book of Revelation and the first chapter. And we go down here. Let me see. Verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword. And in the same verse where it says... From his mouth went a sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. His face shining with glory is what we're to look at according to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 when we're changed into his image like Jacob was changed into Israel. And remember what I said about being changed into Israel? Israel means prince. Prince is a kingdom term. He's coming into a kingdom existence now. Not just a supplanter and a deceiver, Jacob. Prince with God, Israel. And Jesus' face was shining like the sun when John was looking at it. He was being changed. And you know, I never saw this before because what happened when the light 
on God's face, Sean and Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. Jacob had that angel touch the hollow of his thigh. In other words, the joint where his thigh went up into his hip and it put it out of place. And look what happened to John. He says, I saw him. That face that's shining like the sun, that face that changes you. Something breaks in you folks when you get changed by the Spirit of God. And it's your flesh that breaks because your flesh has been the problem. And if you're going to change, you need to break that flesh. Watchman Nee used to always say things like that. He said, remember the woman that Mary Magdalene broke the jar of perfume and anointed Jesus' feet? And then Judas got all upset for the, that's a valuable alabaster box. We could sell that and get money. And he was just hungry for money. But here, that precious alabaster box that everybody's afraid of breaking, that's our flesh. Our flesh is so precious to us. But if we break it, that inward image of God comes out. Hallelujah. That perfume comes out. We, Our lives become a sweet-smelling savor unto God rather than something that stinks in the nostrils of God. And it breaks. And here, John broke. He fell at his feet as dead. The old John, so to speak, was gone. And a new John, symbolically speaking, came forth. And Jesus lays his right hand on him as he's in a kind of death. And he says, fear not, I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Why is John saying, I felt like I was dead? And then Jesus said, don't fear, I was dead. But I'm alive forevermore. If he didn't have a picture of resurrecting John in a spiritual sense. It's like the prodigal son went through like a resurrection when he went into the cocoon in that pig pen when he was just going to blow all his inheritance on women. And then he came to himself in the cocoon, the pig pen. He came out of it and said, I'm going back to my father's house. Jacob was going back to the promised land. Abraham's people had gone into Egypt and they were going back to the promised land when Moses gave them these words. Hallelujah. And here John is seeing this, this very thing. But what I was going to say is while his face is shining like the sun, at the same time, out of his mouth is coming a sword. And if it's a sword out of the mouth, that's why the sword of the Spirit is the Word. Out of your mouth, it's a Word. And the Word of God is what the apostles were actually... Wow, this is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly at this point. But this is 2 Corinthians 3. The Word that the, the, the apostles preached. He said, we preach Jesus. We preach Jesus. Why do we preach Jesus? Because God who caused the light to shine out of darkness, has spoken in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That's why we preach Jesus. It's in the face of Jesus. And that glory that we're ministering to, that word that we're preaching, that sword coming from the mouth is the word of God. It's the same thing as seeing the light in the face of Jesus. It'll change you. You see, the common denominator between the sword of the Spirit coming from his mouth and his face shining like the sun is both of them are telling us the same thing in two different ways. It's changing you. It's changing you. And in here, oh, this is amazing. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about entering into a rest. A rest. Entering getting into this Canaanic realm, this Canaan experience. And he said, when we believe, we enter into that rest. When we have this kind of faith that I don't know what God's going to do, but he's going to do something. And what was it that killed them literally over the 40-year span and laid their carcasses in the desert when they wouldn't go into the land of Canaan? It was their unbelief. Unbelief, you live after the flesh, you'll die. But you walk after the spirit, you'll live. And we walk not by sight, but by faith. Sight means I know what God's going to do. I know everything is going to lay out. I know every answer there is, and I know what I'm going to do. And God says, I've got to get that out of you, and I've got to bring you to a place where you don't have a clue what to do on your own, and you don't even know what I'm going to do when I can do anything. So I can get that out of you, that you get the steering wheel removed out of your hands, you get that comfortable control, and I need to let you come to a place where you trust me so much that you're comfortable when I start driving. You ever 
give your car over to a child of yours, get them behind the steering wheel, get her behind the steering wheel. Now they got to learn to drive and you're just looking at the road. You're holding on to the armrest of the door. Your knuckles are turning white. You're afraid because you're not in control and you don't know if you can trust this one. <laughs> well, that's what kind of like our flesh feels like when God takes control because we like being in control. So God says, I'm going to change that. I'm going to shine my glory in you as you look at my face and it's going to break that flesh. John, you're going to fall dead. Jacob, you're going to be limping the rest of your life. <laughs> and here, that sword that comes out of my mouth, he says, I'm going to take that sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, that word is. And I'm going to pierce right into your soul and spirit. I'm going to take out all that unbelief by inserting a sword of truth. Truth is going to get in you like a sword so much that it's going to get rid of unbelief. And then there's nobody, by the way, that's not manifest in my sight. I know your hearts. I know your thoughts. I know your intents. I'm a discerner of your thoughts and intents. Every creature's manifest in my sight. All things are naked and open unto me. And Paul says, because we've got that kind of high priest who takes a sacrifice and opens it up with a sword, that's the illusion that he's trying to keep you in mind of when he's saying Jesus is a high priest. Because high priests, they'll take a sacrifice and open it up and skin it and flay it and get right in down into the nitty gritty. And Jesus is going to do that to us. He's our high priest. And you know what's so wonderful? That Zechariah chapter 6 and I believe it's verse 13, speaks about his high priesthood. And it says, even he shall build the temple of the Lord upon this rock. I'm going to build my church. How'd you like him to build you on a rock where you got such rock solid faith that the storms can't tear you down? Well, on the rock, he's going to build the church and he's going to bear the glory, not you, not me. And he's going to sit and rule, not you, not me. He's ruling on his throne. Ark of the Covenant picture, and he's going to be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace is going to be between them both. The, the kingship of his throne and the priesthood ministry between both of them. That's where you're going to have the council of peace. He's the prince of peace. Hallelujah. And if he can be king over your life and also be high priest over your life, you see, it's easy to understand what it means for him to be king. We, we submit to him and he leads us. But for him to be high priest, that's another story. That's talking about cutting us open like sacrifices, according to Hebrews chapter four. And that's talking about, let me bring that back again. I'm sorry, I just went to the wrong screen. That's talking about getting us into a place where he digs in we are changed, the sword coming out of his mouth, his face shining like the sun, both of them are accomplishing the same thing. And Paul described the preaching, the sword coming out of their mouths as a word that's changing their lives. They're preaching Jesus, the word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. And that light, both of them change us into his image. And that's what Hebrews 4 is talking about. Why? So we can get into that land that at the end of chapter 3, we read as a foreshadow of what we're supposed to come into. He says, I wanted to take them into the promised land. He said, they tempted me. They proved me. They saw my works 40 years, but I was greed with them because they always err in their hearts. They've not known my ways. He said, I'm going to swear they're not going into my rest. That's why they died in the wilderness 40 years later. And he said, but you need to be aware of the same thing because it could happen to you and I, I can't take you in. And there'll be anger toward you as well because you don't believe, you don't trust me. He said, exhort one another daily. And that sword, that flaming sword at the entrance to the Garden of Eden is the same thing. It's the sword in the hand of the high priest. Amen. The cherubim on either side of the sword, just like the sword was the word of God that God spoke from between the cherubim. I'll commune with you from between the cherubim. That sword is the word of God and it changes us. It cuts us. And that's the high priesthood of Jesus. Have you ever wondered, what's the high priesthood of Jesus about? I understand the kingship, but what's his high priesthood? And furthermore, I'm a king and a priest. What's my priesthood? Well, 
It's to take the word of the Lord like the high priest does. And it's to help get people's hearts opened up. And God does heart surgery. Hallelujah. He goes in there and works and changes the heart. And, and the light shines on the heart. And the heart is changed into that same image. And then you get such a faith like Jesus. Talk about getting into Jesus' image. When Jesus started his ministry, and I'm going to have to bring this down. The time is just flying here tonight. But we'll go a little, little more if we have to. He started his ministry with this concept. Satan, you want me to control it. You told Eve she could be like God herself, and you're trying to do it to me too. But he said, man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. And I don't know what my father's going to do, but I'm not going to turn stone into bread. I'm letting him guide me. I'm not going to take things into my own hands. He's going to lead me, and I don't even know what he's going to do, but I know he's going to do something. And he wants us to to have that experience. That's the bread, I believe. That's part of the bread, at least, I believe, that he spoke about when he said, disciples, you wonder where I get food? I get food, I get bread to eat that you know not of. My bread is to do the will of God and finish it. And I think that's kind of what God's saying to us. We need to have that kind of faith where we're going to do the will of God. And what is the will of God? It's to be so completely submissive to him and so trusting of him that when we give him the steering wheel, we're not turning our knuckles white as we clench the sides of our seats. We trust him. We have that trust. And when we have that kind of trust, this is, oh man, this is what the Holy Ghost was leading me toward. And I didn't even finish it all tonight. I love it because I can talk more about it later. But that's why they held the Ark of the Covenant over their heads and went into the Jordan. Hallowed. They didn't take that ark. Let, in fact, let me close with that here tonight. Watch this. <laughs> in Numbers chapter, let me see, 14. This is when the doubters, they blew it. In Numbers 14, they murmured against Moses. They murmured against Aaron. They said, we wish we would have died in the land of Egypt. Would to God we died. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? Remember when they first came out of the promised land or out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness? Moses, why did you bring us? Now they're more brazen than that. Remember they that's when God gave them manna? That's when he gave them the water out of the rock? When they said, Would to God we died, you brought us out here, Moses, to kill us. But here they got more brazen than that, because then now they directly say, Why is the Lord brought us into this land? To fall by the sword? Did God, the Lord, bring our wives and children to be prey? Weren't it better if God didn't bother with us and left us in Egypt? Can you feel the fear of God shaking your spirit and reading this? This is how brave. You see, they wouldn't say that at first. They blamed Moses with the manna before the manna came. But now they're directly bringing the Lord into it. And they said, let us make us a captain and let's go back. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. And Joshua, which were of them that searched the land. See, they had already searched the land at this point. They, did, they didn't get that junk out of their hearts. They got worse with that junk. Actually coming against God, naming him. No wonder God swore in his wrath, they're not going into the land. He said, just don't rebel. They still had a chance at this point. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us into this land. God's stronger than the giants. He's greater than the walls. If he just don't rebel against the Lord. Like Joshua was kind of getting really scared for them. Don't fear the people of the land. They're bread for us. Talking about bread. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Is there something wrong with your minds? God can take care of that. But... Oh, you don't want to read the word but after somebody's appealing to them like that. All the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of God appeared. Oh, here's where the glory of God, you don't want it to appear like this. And he said, Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I've done and showed among them? I'll smite them with pestilence. I'll disinherit them. I'll make of thee a greater nation. 
And Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it. You brought us up from the Egyptians and and in your might, and they're going to tell it to the inhabitants of the land. And they heard that you were among us and they're going to, you, you were face to face. Talk about changing face to face and your clouds stood by them and you went before them by day and so forth and so on. And if you kill the people like one man, then the nations that have heard of the fame will speak saying, the Lord wasn't able to bring this people into the land, which he swear, therefore he slew them in the wilderness. So I beseech you, God, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou spoken, saying, Lord is long suffering, great mercy, forgiving iniquity, and so forth and so on. Pardon, I beg you to pardon them, God. And the Lord said, I've pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with my glory. Because those men which seen my glory, my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these 10 times, and have not hearkened to me, they won't see the land that I swear to their fathers. But my servant Caleb, because he's got another spirit, and he's followed me fully. How'd you like to be like that? You follow God fully. You don't get scared. You don't say, oh no, what am I going to do? Why did God allow this to happen? I'm going to bring him in. And then we read, let's go down to verse 44. After God told them, don't go. You're not going in the land. God won't let you go. You see, they said, we're going to go into the land. We're not going to die in the wilderness. See how quickly they changed? But it wasn't a change due to their faith. It was a change due to their fleshly fear. We've sinned, but we're going to go now. And Moses said, don't go. No. It's God said no now. It's changed. I'm sorry. He says, you're going to be smitten. The Amalekites, Canaanites, watch this, we're coming up to it. But they presumed to go up to the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not with them. Did you notice that? The Ark didn't go with them. The Ark didn't go with them. That represented they weren't going in faith that God was king. They were still rebels. If God would have blessed them and let them go in this time, he would have had a bunch of babies on his hand that turned their back on him. The next thing, something went wrong because they weren't taking the ark. They weren't taking their servitude to his throne and kingship. That's what that means. But bless, bless God in Joshua. <laughs> Chapter 6. The Lord says to Joshua, Now it's 40 years later, they're dead, you guys are going in. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go around that Jericho city. I want you to compass it. Hallelujah. And that wall is going to fall down flat. And he said, take up the ark and bring it with us. What happened to those older generational folks? The ark didn't go with them. But these folks have the ark with them. Jesus is on the throne. And praise God. We're going in with that servitude to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. We're going to go in. And they not only marched around Jericho with the ark, but before they went into Jordan, they took the ark and it opened up the Jordan. They had that faith. They had that confidence and that trust. And God says, you're going to shut your mouths every day you walk around Jericho because they didn't shut their mouths 40 years ago when they mouthed and spread that poison throughout all the people that the giants were too big and the walls were too thick. So you're being quiet this time. And you know something? I'm not sending in 12 spies like I did before. I'm sending in two spies. I want the two. Remember two out of the 12 back at uh, Kadesh Barnea? Joshua and Caleb believed. So God only sent two spies. He sent 12 spies in back then with Moses. He sent two spies this time with Joshua and the two spies went to the harlot's house and she became one of the children of God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, folks, taking in the ark represents I'm going to have faith in him that when I don't even know what he's going to do, I'm going to be relaxed. I'm not going to get afraid. I'm going to serve him. And as high priest, he's going to reach down from that throne. He shall be priest on his throne. And he's going to take his sword, the sword comes from his mouth, and he's going to open up and he's going to dig into my heart and he's going to burn out like a laser every crumb and grain of unbelief he can find. 
because he's my priest and I'm a living sacrifice. And he's going to take that out of me so that when he's done, hallelujah, I'm going to come forth as pure gold and go on in. Hallelujah, God. The old generation died. The old Jacob died and Israel came in. The old generation died. The younger generation came in. Ishmael was cast out of the house and Isaac was free. Amen. Abram turned to Abraham. Sarai turned to Sarah. Hallelujah. And we go from a mouthy brat of a prodigal son into a humbled, come out of a cocoon of a pig pen, child of the father, and run back to his house. I've got meat that you know not of, disciples. I've got bread that it comes from the mouth of God, not bread alone like you're thinking. Every thing can't be settled by natural means. Man shall not live by natural means alone. Man shall not get by on his own wits. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you'd like to learn more about in-depth study and revelation from the Word of God, join Breath of Life Academy. Each month, four videos come out, and you can get into a second tier where you will receive an e-book of all the study notes, or a third tier where you get the paperback books of all the study notes. Join Breath of Life Academy. Learn how to receive revelation from the Word of God and how to study the Bible. Go to patreon.com slash breathoflifeacademy. God bless and we'll see you at the Academy. It's time for our offering. And if you'd like to give to our ministry, and this is a blessing to you, you can do so by e-transfer or PayPal at bolm.portage at gmail.com or paypal.me slash breath of life church. We really appreciate your giving and it goes toward the work of this ministry. Thanks and God bless.